In January 1963, at the age of 31, Dervla finally began her journey, reaching New Delhi approximately six months later on July 18th. Having read Dervla's book Full Tilt, which documents her adventure, I felt inspired to make this film in an attempt to discover just how much has changed in the half century since it was published. What did people th say when you first said you were going to cycle to India? Well, I suppose I'd wanted to do it for so long since I was a child. Yeah. And it had, I mean, all my relatives and friends knew that was my ambition, so nobody was particularly surprised. The UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office advises against all travel to Afghanistan. Knowing this, I decided against going there in person and instead sought out an Afghan national who was no longer living in their home country. In 2014, over 41,000 Afghans applied for asylum in the European Union. Well, um, I'm 27 years old now and I'm working in a museum. Um, and um, I left uh, Afghanistan, I think, 22 years ago. Wow. That makes me five years old when we left, right? Yeah. yeah. So we were. Uh, I was five years old when we had to leave, and we had to leave because of the war. And um, recently, two years ago, uh, I went back for the first time. So after 21 uh, years, uh, last summer I went back. Yes. Yeah. So that was the first time. Wow. It was a very exciting, big moment. When I was younger, I didn't. I didn't really know what was happening. I was like, okay, we live in the Netherlands now. As a child, you know there's war and you can't live in your own home country anymore, but you don't know what exactly happened. Now, well, in 2001, when uh, Afghanistan came in the picture, you start asking questions and you get to know you get to know the history. Under the Taliban, women in Afghanistan were made to wear the burqa by law. They were also banned from working and from attending school or university. Although the Taliban were officially ousted in 2001, conservative dress is still widely enforced, and in 2011, Afghanistan was named the most dangerous country to be a woman. Remember, it was still a kingdom when I was there. The king was ruling. And in the uh, university, young men and women were sit students were sitting beside each other in the lecture halls, sharing desks, mm -hmm. and no question of um, everybody veiled and yeah, yeah. I mean it was and on the street because in those days the what what do they call it that very when the skirts were very short, mini skirts yeah, <laughs> and some young cobalt woman who felt like wearing a mini skirt could wear it yeah. You yeah. see, people don't believe it when I tell them that. Yeah. You know. The the image, you know, of the backward, um, fiercely um, anti-woman and, and um, you know, I mean, the whole picture is so unlike what I remember. From the stories of my parents, it was a country like in, in a fairy tale, always. They had a good life and there were parties and... And there was education and women were working, women were going to universities. And if you go back now, you see a country that had the, a civilized country that is pulled back into the dark ages. 53 years ago when I was there, there was no poverty in Afghanistan. Right. None. It was totally undeveloped, and this is our problem, confusing undevelopment with poverty. Yeah. I didn't see anybody in the villages where I stayed, or in Kabul, uh, anybody hungry, or in rags, or ill-housed. They had a thriving export uh, trade of fruit 
dried and fresh fruit to both Iran and Pakistan. Uh, they grew, they were absolutely self-sufficient in mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. And to hear this description as, as though it were some unfortunate, you know, country doomed poverty until we came along to rescue it. So tell me about when you went back to Kabul and what it was like and whether you could remember anything from when you were little and what had changed. Yeah, well, it was a, it was a moment that you had in your mind for like forever. I was always um, looking forward to the moment that I would be uh, back with my own people and back to my roots. And you have this very idealistic Im imagination of this. and. When I came there, well, it was a shock, of course, when you when you come to the airport and you're like, oh, okay. I, I would have really liked to go to Afghanistan because I feel like from, from what I read in your book, it was the place that you felt yeah, most really strongly like, connected to. I certainly wouldn't want to go back there and have no, well, the I devastation. Think, yeah. What did Kabul look like? Is it... Because... I don't know. I think a lot of Western people that would think about Afghanistan would think that all the cities were just ruins and like the buildings would be half falling down and all that kind of thing. And is that no, the case? Not, no, no, no. Uh, you see all kinds of buildings. First of all, you see all these beautiful big houses in in the old um, um, in the old area where we lived, and well, they're quite the same. Nothing's been touched, and you know. No new styles have been added to that to those houses, and that gave me an idea from oh, um, that's how my parents lived and that's how we lived. And on television, you always think that it's one big pile of sand. And when I came there, I saw mountains and lakes, and I was like, oh my god, it's really beautiful. <laughs> um, we went up the hills in Parman in Kabul. And you, you saw all these women, uh, they were all picnicking and all, you know, they were also um, going out as, a, as a, they were not staying in. And when, when my sister and I, we looked a little further, we saw these women were playing football with each other, you know, with all these meals on. Wow. And they were playing football and I was like, okay, maybe some things are getting better. Yeah. When you meet new people, do you tell them... That you're an Afghan, or do you tell them that you're from the Netherlands? No, that I'm an Afghan. You always say Afghan. Well, yeah. Well, I'm very proud of it. Yeah. It's a silly thing to say that you're proud, but I do have, you know, in my house I have a Persian rug, and uh, <laughs> so it's it's definitely a thing. It's part of me, and I'm. Yeah, it makes me who I am. पता हम उधर रह रहे हैं ना हमें पता है कि ठीक रह रहे हैं हम सब कुछ चलता है इधर भी चलता है हर मुल्क में चलता है लेकिन ये है कि वो बहुत बढ़ा चढ़ा के बहुत उसको डिग्रेड करते हैं हमारे कंट्री को हमारे लोगों को कि ये इस तरह है ये इस तरह है इतना ज़्यादा नहीं है Having spoken to Saad and Zahida, I decided I had no excuse to stay in the UK and set about planning a trip to Pakistan. It was amazing to visit some of the places Dervla had described in her book as like bliss or paradise. Shakila was one of those, although I imagine much has changed since she was here. 
gosh, lovely new map. It's a lovely map, yeah, because we bought this. Because it looks I was, a very good map. I was looking at all the maps that were drawn in your book, mm -hmm. and they're quite vague. Trimish, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I thought I'd buy a nice shiny road map, and then we can show, I can show you on here where well, I went. There'd be roads there. That was well, that's the thing. There, <laughs> Absolutely. And towns. Mutta teimme niin, että Pakistan ja Taliban ja Vajat ja Damakang tuban, Noksan tuban, Mikko Noksan tuban, teille te muu uue kam numan, mimarke Noksan manla, ole hardisho Noksan kustamalla. Mutta ja niin, muuto viskolle, kusta karvaari katumalla, ettei järmo saman, ettei kiga kisi vaa. Muuto veskapi, järsua bilum, kuka meri kaka niitsi tum, ikä saman muuto kaabisan. Tämä on kai kai mendu manke kai vaan. Tuleste, mereka mu apa? Dua yang kulit arum iban. Taliban wajar kalau kita Taliban yang nu yang numan dom iban. Her father used to do handicrafts work, and she's saying that that her father was able to support the whole family of twelve easily, you know, without any big issues or anything like that. So can you ask her when the last time she saw a foreigner was? So you know the, the, the lady Shukra Bibi who we just interviewed um, in her shop, I just found this. Yeah. It says uh, saving embroidery one stitch at a time. And uh, this 79 year old has been making <coughs> embroidered items since she was 10 years old. And she was awarded the highest civilian award uh, in, in Pakistan by the government. Wow. Uh, it's called the Pride of Performance Award. Yeah. And she's so humble and it, it's, it's, it's amazing. I, it's quite sad that her business is struggling so much now yeah, as well. She, she's been all over the news and she's probably the most famous uh, stitcher, uh, stitcher uh, you know, small business owner here and she is struggling. So yeah. I wonder what the, what the other people who haven't gotten this much recognition, what, how, how much they are struggling. I know that you wrote quite a lot in the book about like being concerned about some of the development mm -hmm. that was planned already because mm -hmm. I think the big main road that goes up from oh, the Oh, they, they, they were building They were building yes. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. As soon as motor traffic comes, you see, the whole, the whole culture, the whole social structure, commercial structure, everything changed. None of these places, whether it's Peshawar, whether it's Mari, these are the places where I spent most of my time. They're not the same, what they used to be. I tell my children we've seen the best and the worst of this country. This country was a beautiful country. It still is, provided it's taken care of. It's a pity. It's a pity that the leaders that we've had so far have done nothing for this country. The majority of the people, they don't get the basic needs. 60% of people in Pakistan live on less than two US dollars a day. It is the sixth most populous country in the world, with a population that is still increasing. Only 58% of Pakistanis are literate, and most do not attend school beyond primary level. As a child, I remember, I mean, those were... Happy days, I would say. Very happy days because there were no financial problems as such. People didn't earn that much, but it was simple living. Yeah. It was very simple living. I 
I'm making this film from the perspective of a, a white English girl mm. coming to visit here and um, obviously it's really interesting to hear like the Pakistani perspective from the horse's mouth as it were mm -hmm. um, and I think that a lot of people in the West have been given very very negative um, stories about Pakistan and, and you know when I told people I was coming here to visit a lot of people were kind of like why why, yeah, what, what why would you want to go yeah, to Pakistan? Why do you, why do you do that? So I mean can you as much as there are a lot of social problems here do you, do you think that it's still would you like to see more people coming here? Oh yes definitely definitely and let me pass on a message to anybody who may be watching this or listening to it, that the people of Pakistan are very hospitable people. They really take care of their guests. Generally, you will find Pakistanis very warm, very helpful. If you go across anywhere, you go to a bazaar, you go to a shop, they'll really give you a lot of respect. They'll look after you, they'll take care of you. They'll make sure that no harm comes to you. I met Kamran in Hunza. Originally from Leia in the south of Pakistan, he was cycling home from Germany, where he had lived for the last 12 years. After cycling through many countries, when I arrived here, so I, I mean, I may be a little bit, you know, it might be a subjective view, but uh, I think it is definitely one of the most beautiful countries. The people are welcoming. I think the only thing which has changed is that now there are no tourists here. Um, but I think the people are as welcoming as before. Yeah. And probably even more because they know that they, they want to, 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 to host other people, you know, to show that their country is beautiful. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for the sake of my own children, for the sake of the people of this country, that this country will rise again. I'm hopeful it will, it's, it's not a hopeless case. The next generation, they're more aware, they know what's right, what's wrong. And I am hoping and I know it for a fact that they will rise up to the occasion and they will bring this country back on its feet. <laughs> I left Pakistan on July 15th, 2015. 52 years and 10 days after Dervla crossed the border into India. So you don't feel like you'd want to go back and check it out? Yeah. Definitely not. <laughs> Good bear. So when you go on, because obviously you've been, you've carried on travelling Mm -hmm. throughout your life. And, yes. And, and is it, is it, are you always looking to go to places that are less built up and is it is it is it that kind of urban development that puts you off places? Oh absolutely yeah. Can't bear those little side poles telling you which way to walk <laughs> where you can find a hut to sleep in. I mean if you're not capable of finding your own sleeping place well then you'd better off stay at home. Zindagi ik safar hai suhana yaha kal kya ho kisne jana Zindagi ek safar hai suhana Yaha kal kya ho kisne jana Zindagi ek safar hai suhana Yaha kal kya ho kisne jana Zindagi ek safar hai suhana Yaha kal kya ho kisne jana Ah, zindagi ek safar hai suhana यहाँ कल क्या हो किसने जाना अरे ओढ़ने 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 ओढ़ 